So this clip is going to solve exercise 8 that refers to regression analysis. So here we go, question 1 refers to data that comes from exercise 6 and some of the results from exercise 6 are given here. We have two variables, A and M, uh, amount of alcohol consumed and mark in a test. And we have sample variances uh, given here. Sample variance of M is 25, of A is 23 and a half, and we have a covariance, negative 23.75. So question A, estimate the regression model where we predict M with, uh, as a function of A. So you can see here, perhaps print a little small, this is a hat. So you also know sometimes we express the regression model with an error term rather than so rather than using the predicted value of m we have the observed value of m and we have uh, beta I think I called it beta naught in the lecture beta 1 ai plus an error term and just as a little review, these guys and these guys, all of these are unobserved. Are unobserved, but we use a sample to get sample estimates. And then we use, we call the sample estimate of beta naught, we call that B naught. Sample estimate of beta one, we call that B one. And we can then write it in two forms. Either we say, well, now we also have sample estimates of the arrow terms, and we call them usually E, so EI, or we write instead the predicted value of M, that is just B0 plus B1 times AI, but then without the arrow term. So these are sort of three ways of uh, writing this. Sometimes we call this up here the population model. Okay, and in there there are the unobserved values. Anyway, that was just a little bit of a sideshow. That's the question here. Um, we want the estimates. So the question is estimate the regression model. What that means is basically that we want these two values. Okay, we want to know what these values are, and we are using sample information to get these. And you need to know the formula. And B1 is the following. It's the covariance, so you just need to know that formula between M and A, our dependent and explanatory variable, divided by the variance of the explanatory variable. That's here A, AI. So using our formulation, our, our uh, results, that is SAM divided by SA squared and therefore this is negative 23.75 divided by SA squared 23.5 so we have a value that is negative and very close to 1 1 1.011 so this is our estimated value for beta 1 and we call that b1. So we also asked to calculate b0 and we always calculate the slope coefficient first. b0 is the average value of the dependent variable, in our case that is m, so we need m bar minus beta 1 which we calculated above, so we're going to use that value here times the average value of the explanatory variable, and that is a here, so a bar. So we're given the values, I think, up here, yeah, average value of m is 18, minus, and now this value, so that's minus minus 1.011, times the average value of a, that was given to be 14, minus 14, so here, 
the value is if you plug everything in and calculate it, 32.154. So this is the result for A. So let's continue with the next part of this question. Here we go. Obtain the coefficient of determination R squared. So this is how closely, this is a value that will tell us how closely our data fit. Actually at this point let me just draw a little sketch. We don't need to go back to the to the actual data. Uh, I just want to sketch this. So we have alcohol as the explanatory variable, mark as the dependent variable. We know there's a negative relationship, so I'll just paint a sort of cluster of values that are negatively related to each other. We have estimated a line of best fit in here. Let this be something like this. We know the intercept to be 32.154 and the slope. It's difficult to, to do this graphically. Just point, point this in here. It's negative 1.011. So the R squared tells us how close these values are to that line. And we just need to know what the formula for the R squared is. And the R squared is basically the covariance between dependent and explanatory variables. So that will be uh, AI and MI squared divided by the product of the two variances, the variance of AI times the variance of MI. You'll find out that this is of course the same as the covariance and let me actually let me now already start with using the short symbols SAM divided by SA, the standard deviation of A, standard deviation of M. Now so far what we have is what we also know is the correlation coefficient but the whole guy squared. So the R squared is the same as the squared correlation coefficient. So let us now calculate that value. So we have the covariance is negative 23.75 the variance so that squared and the variance of A was 23.5 and the variance of M, we'll just have to go back, variance of M was 25 times 25 so we need to calculate the value of this let's do this um, 23.5 times 25 is that 1 over times 23.75 I'll omit the negative because I'll do that twice so the negative will disappear times 23.75 so we get 0.9601 Okay, so that's the result. 0 0.9601. So what does that mean? That means that approximately 96% of the variation in grade is explained by variation in alcohol co consumption. So, as you know, consumption, I'll abbreviate that, that measure will be between, will be larger than zero, or larger than equal than zero, and smaller than equal than one, where a value of one would indicate that all the points actually all the observations actually lie on the regression line. So this value here of 0.9601 is pretty close to 1. It seems to say that 
a lot of the grade is explained by alcohol consumption. Now you can possibly tell that these data I made up myself uh, because unlikely why it may be quite likely that there's a relationship it's not going to be that uh, that strong but um, here we go that's the luxury of a teacher I can make up data so let's go to the next question show by calculation that the regression line passes through the mean of both variables. Now we know that the mean of the mean or the mean grade was given to be 18. So let me just graphically do this. So 18 and the mean of the average alcohol consumption was 14. I think that was measured in units. So let's say 14 was here. I'll just write the number in here. So the question is demonstrate that this point here actually lies on the line. Okay, the point where we have a equals to 14 and m equals to 18 ends up on on this line. So how do we show this by calculation? Well, our regression line we calculated that before. Let me. Oops, that's not what I want. Wanted. Here was our formula for the re for the regression line. I shall just copy that. Nah, doesn't work. I'll just rewrite it. So the regression line was. M I hat was equal to our estimate for the constant that was B naught that was 32.154 times B1 B1 was negative 1.011 so negative 1.011 times A I so we basically now want to know whether if we are looking at AI equals to 14, whether we end up, if we plug 14 in, whether we end up on the left hand side with an 18. Okay, so let's just calculate this. So 32.154 minus 1.011 times 14. Now these coefficient values there, they are rounded. Okay, there's some rounding, so we may now end up with something that is just ever so slightly different. So, like, uh, minus um, parenthesis 1.011 times 14. Close parenthesis equals. Well, how beautiful is that? We actually get exactly 18. So this equality turns out to be correct. And we answered question C. So we continue with D and E that sort of relate to each other. So we'll look at them together. So next question, calculate the predicted value for M given that the value is 24. Well, we basically do exactly the same as uh, as we just did, our regression line is described by this equation, 0.011 times, and now AI, but now we want to use 24 for A. Okay, so we have this. We'll make our calculator out again, negative 1.011 times 24 plus 32.154, what we get is 7.89. So that is 7.89. So that was part D. Now part E, if the actual value of M from the case, so this actually to get the notation right, that is M hat at a value of A equal to 24. Now, if an actual value, if, an, if we had an actual value where we have 24 
an input of 24 units of alcohol, but the grade was 5.83, what is your prediction error? So that means we are somewhere, our line, let me just do this on this graph, if we have 24 inputs, we are predicting 7.89. 7.89, but now we have an observation, let me do that in red, where the actual observation is 5.83, so the actual observation is somewhere below here. So we are underneath the regression line. So the question is now what is the regression error? To understand this, to get the sign of this right, it's possibly best to, to work from this equation okay or if you if you have to if you don't remember whether it's mi minus mi hat or the other way around it's supposed to be best to work from here so let me write this down again mi equals b naught plus b1 times ai plus the regression error at i now this guy here this was what we just calculated up here that was mi hat, okay, so the predicted value. So what we actually have is mi equals mi hat plus the error term. So if we now solve this for the error term, what we get is mi minus mi hat, so we just got this on the other side, is equal to epsilon i. So here we have the actual observation was 5.83, our prediction was 7.89 and therefore we get an error term the error term is negative 2.06 negative 2.06 so it means that the distance here in that graph between 7.89 and 5.83 is negative 2.06. Okay, that distance. That's what we just calculated. So that was the finish of question one. So let's continue on to question two. Question two, quite a lot is repetition of what we've just done, but you can never repeat stuff enough. So here we go. Again, we have a regression. Uh, problem, I will turn out in B as a regression problem. Uh, we have two variables. We have the mortality rate and cigarette consumption. You see I'm a bit on the health trip here. Um, and we call, here we go, Y is going to be the mortality rate, rate per hundred thousands, and X is going to be the per capita cigarette consumption. So, we have a number of statistics, average values, variances and standard deviations, and we also have a covariance here. So firstly, A, calculate and interpret Rxy. Remember, that was the, I'll just use something less dramatic than red, that was the sample correlation. How did we calculate that? That was the covariance between x and y, short form sxy, divided by sx times sy. So what we have here is 415.787 divided by the two standard deviations, the product of the two standard deviations, which is here, sx was 20. 2.13 times 137.583 and when you calculate this your result is going to be 0 0.137 so what we can see is that there's a positive correlation so we need to calculate and interpret so we have a positive correlation so if at all there, there's some positive relationship here that means the more cigarette 
cigarettes are being smoked, the higher the mortality rate. So this is possibly uh, so in states. So the observations are data for particular states in the U uh, in the U.S. So it's a positive correlation, but it is not very strong. Not very strong. In fact, you may ask the question, is it really different from zero? Remember, this is a sample correlation. So we possibly didn't have data from all states. Um, and it may be that really there isn't a relationship, but we just calculated a particular sample correlation, got a value somewhat different to zero, but perhaps it's really not significantly different from zero. So with that in mind, let's go to the regression model. Estimate the regression model. So we have slope coefficient b and intercept a, and we know what to do. B is going to be the covariance between x and y divided by the variance of the explanatory variable. Which one's the explanatory variable here? It's x. Okay, that makes sense. That's cigarette consumption. Unlikely that the mortality rate will influence the cigarette consumption, if at all the other way around. So it's sample variance of x. So let's just briefly calculate that. So that is 415.787 divided by 489.737. And you see the variance here. Is this value the variance of x, sample variance of x? If you do that, we'll get 0.849. Oops, sorry, 0.849 and a. We have the mean of the dependent variable, so that's y bar minus b times the mean of the explanatory variable, that's x bar. y bar was 8.55. 0.843 now it's from here minus the value we just calculated 0.849 times the average value of the explanatory variable 120.527 and if you calculate that what you get is 753.5 on zero. So here we continue with part C of the question. Here we go. Obtain and interpret the coefficient of determination. We had a question like this before. We had to calculate R squared. Here it is, and there was covariance squared divided by the product of the variances. So here we have R squared is the covariance, here that's SXY squared divided by the product of the variances, so SX squared times SY squared. So the covariance was 415.787. Now we can continue this calculation, of course, Okay, but now let's also use a result which we uh, discussed about before. We know that the R squared is also the same as the squared of the correlation coefficient, and we have the correlation coefficient already. Calculate that before, that was 0 0.137. 0 0.137 and that's squared. And uh, that will of course give us 0. 019. Okay, but you can get exactly the same result if you just continue with this formula. This was just a little trick, knowing that this is equal to R squared. That saved us some calculation. Again, we're asked to interpret approximately 2%, so 1.9%, therefore approximately 2% of the variation in mortality across states across states can be explained
by variation in cigarette cons consumption. In cigarette consumption. Now, does it make sense to relate these two things? Well, in fact, it does because we know that cigarette consumption is a bad thing health wise uh, and leads to mortality individually and therefore also on average across a state. So, should there be a state where on average people smoke more, it's perfectly plausible to think that they will die earlier as well. However, how much does that effect contribute? to the variation in mortality rates, 2%. So it's quite, well, it, I guess it depends whether you think that's a lot or not, given that this is by choice, i.e. by smoking, 2% variation, you may actually argue that this is quite, uh, quite a lot, but that leaves a lot of variation in the dependent variable to be explained by other factors. Okay, and you can think of, you know, nutrition, health system, all sorts of things that will contribute to this. So, next question. Here we go, D. How would you interpret the coefficient B in the model? Now recall, B was equal to 0.849. So in general, we interpret the slope coefficient as the following, if the explanatory variable increases by one unit then, and really we should say here without discussing that, then on average the dependent variable and variable will increase by b units. So, and all you need to replace now is the following bits. Let me underline them by, with green. Okay, the explanatory variable will replace the name of our, our variable. Increase by one unit, that remains the same. Then the dependent variable, so we will replace this bit, will increase by B unit. Ah, we, we may change the unit as well, we may give this unit's name and then we'll replace uh, the B. So let's just do this and I'll, I'll try and do this color coded to make it obvious. So if the, if the, and I green, explanatory variable, that's our average cigarette uh, consumption. Uh, you see, so the, the per capita cigarette consumption per year. Okay, if the average cigarette consumption I'll plaque again increases by one and now the unit, and the unit was cigarette. My one cigarette. Then, on average, the dependent variable, the dependent variable is the mortality rate. mortality rate, and now we go back, will increase by, and now B, B was 0 0.49, 0 0.849, 0 0.849, and now units, so let's go back to see exactly how this was defined, 
mortality rate per 1000 so it will increase by 0.849 per 100,000 okay so that's how we interpret uh, that B last part of that question if the per capita cigarette consumption in one particular state was 150 obtain the fitted value and calculate the residual for this state where the actual mortality rate is 860 so let's recall what we also said in the previous question yi equals a plus b times xi plus ei and we know that this bit here I'll just put that in blue is just exactly the same as the predicted value plus ei so let's calculate the predicted value first so why I predicted is um, a I'm going to pick this up in a second I remember that uh, B was 0.849 and our particular value of the cigarette consumption was 150 so 150 so let's just pick up what a was a was 753.51 753.51 so let us calculate this as times 150 plus 753.51 so 880.86 so this is 880.86 so we know here in our formula we have this one here is 880.86 now we know that our actual mortality rate is 860 860 so the question is what is the EI we can solve this equation we just subtract 880.86 from both sides of the equation and what we then get is EI is equal to 860 minus 880.86 and that is the same as negative 20.86 this is our estimated residual for that particular state in which the average uh, cigarette consumption is 150 cigarettes per year So the actual mortality rate is 860, so the state health-wise does a little better than predicted. Let's move on to question 3. So here we go. Here's the question. Um, that is uh, question 3 of the exercise. Question 3. It refers you to a website which I've opened to look at in a minute. In there, there's a regression which was also re we used that or Martin uh, Star talked about that in his talk. He didn't really talk a lot about the regression more than how it was used. Um, but what we want to do now is we want to learn more about this regression. And it turns out this is a two variable regression. So we have one dependent variable we have in population form uh, constant and slope parameter times the explanatory variable plus an error term so our question here is what's the definition of this yi and the xi okay so that's what we're gonna uh, discuss here so let's start with yi the dependent variable now we'll just do this parallel over here we'll do xi 
it's supposed to be an ID explanatory variable. Perhaps you will remember from the talk that the what they did in the Financial Times in this instance is to, to relate outcomes, exam outcomes at school level with sort of measures of social deprivation where the students came from. Okay, so here this is going to be something like that will measure exam outcomes and this will measure the level of deprivation. So what we shall do now is we shall look at this article. Some of what you see in here should uh, look familiar. For instance, uh, this graph, we saw that in, in the talk. I don't think I'm going to talk a lot about this here. In here you can also see uh, the write down of regression equation. The y is called academic percentile and the x variable is called poverty percentile. Actually, let's just write this down but we'll explain this in a little bit more detail. So academic percentile and poverty percentile. So this was called academic percentile and poverty percentile. So where do the data come from? Let's start with the poverty percentile. So there's a little bit here and here you can see this, this bit here, first bullet point, the, the, as Martin said in his talk, the government mainly uses a binary indicator, are you eligible for school meals or not? What this data use, by, by the way, it's um, the observations are by student, okay, not by school, but by student, and they, they got this national pupil database uh, to, to calculate this data and what you can see there is the postcode for individual students and then they use this to go to this the index of multiple deprivation let's just follow this link this leads you to um, a statistic of offered by the published by the government you can go to the index of deprivation and we'll just open it we'll just quickly want to see what this spreadsheet looks like so it's a a big big spreadsheet and uh, what you can see here is all sorts of little areas LSOA areas I forgot what exactly that stands for local I don't know area is the end an official possibly I can't quite remember what the S is you can see for all sorts of areas there they're quite they're quite small Areas, for instance, let's find Manchester. Manchester, here we go. So you can see that's from 5062. So Manchester is basically divided into about 260 little areas. Okay, and for each of these little areas, we have, let's go back to the top of the graph again, this blue, uh, this blue one is the rank of the index of multiple deprivation. You can see you get very high numbers here and lower numbers. One means the most deprived. So you can see these now these numbers vary. vary. Okay, let's see how many areas have we actually got. We got about 32,482 areas. So the rank will go up to that number. The lower the number, the more be deprived. So this is basically uh, what they did is they matched the postcode of an individual student to which area that postcode belongs to. That's actually a quite tricky exercise. And um, once they have that, they basically know the percentile. Ah, percentile. Let me go back to that slide. Remember what we uh, after our percentile, we talked about percentiles. For instance, let's calculate the percentile of one of our Manchester areas without knowing which particular part of Manchester that is. So this particular part of Manchester 
had a rank of 1588. So let's do a little example. They had a rank was 1588, and we said that all over how many arrays did we have? 32483. 32482 32482 so remember lower numbers mean more deprived that means that for this particular district which had rank 1588 there are 1587 areas that are more deprived than this particular area and now we have to do a little bit of maths 32482 minus 1588. That is that 32482 minus 1588. So we have 30,894. 30,894, which are less deprived. Okay, so this is a pretty deprived area in Manchester. Um, now the question is what percentage of areas in England are less deprived than this particular one? Well it's 1587 out of 32482. So let's calculate that. One 587 divided by 32482. So that is about 4.9%. Okay, so that basically means that this particular area is in the 4.9 percentile. Okay. 4.9% of all areas are more deprived than this. And the uh, flip side of the coin is that 95.1% of all areas are less deprived than this area. So this is what we mean with the poverty percentile. Okay, So each student will be associated with one of these areas and then we can calculate the poverty percentile for this area. Next, the academic percentile. Let's go back to the Financial Times website. Basically what they do here is they, they don't give all that much information but they have all the achievements of all of these students and they basically create an index of this or a combined variable. Remember we did that as well, we standardized each and then we could add the scores. Here they create a combination of um, maths, English literature, language, sciences, modern language, history and geography scores. With an index they got this for each student and then they ranked the students and then they could again calculate a percentile for that. So that's the academic percentile for an individual student. Okay, So let's say we get 32 point seven percentile for a particular student that means that thirty two point seven percent of all students did worse than that student and sixty seven point three percent did better than that student. Now you can always produce these percentiles in two directions. Okay, so it could be thirty two point seven percent um did better or thirty two point seven percent did worse. This is, it's not really important which way around it is, you just have to be careful in the interpretation, but it's at, at the result stage, if you are just presented the results as here in the Financial Times, you don't really need to know which one that is. So, um, now perhaps just quickly, so what they do is they uh, report sort of values for this beta. Okay, and they, they are positive. Okay, actually that now means we can um, we can say something. So let's say we have, for instance, a value of 0.3. It's in this 
in this area. So if we get a beta hat of about 0.3, okay, so that means if someone, uh, so it means if the dependent variable, if the explanatory variable increases, on average the dependent variable will increase. So we know that if you live in less deprived areas, you do better. Okay, so here we have less deprived means a higher number, and that will mean you go into a higher percentile on average of the academic performance. Okay, so academic performance will be interpreted that, or it was defined such that higher numbers. Uh, are equivalent to better results. So if you are in the first percentile, you did pretty poor. So we can see that these numbers are all positive, and what you can what you can also see is that on average these numbers come down a little bit. They estimated this regression for different years, data from different years, and you can see that the, these coefficients come down. So this relationship between the level of social deprivation and the exam performance, relative exam performance, because we're looking at percentiles, has become weaker. All right, And uh, why it has become weaker, Martin talked about that in the talk, it's become weaker mainly because the poor students do better because quite a lot of the um, educational policy measures has been directed at the poor students. All right, have we answered our question? I think we have. Describe in your own words what the dependent variable and the explanatory variable was. Okay, so uh, this was all.